This is one of my favorite tools. They're called locking pliers, but you probably know them by their trade name, vice grips. I think what's special about vice grips is they're not really designed to do any specific job, but they're often the tool, the only tool, that can get the job done. Usually when I use vice grips, you know things aren't going well. <laughs> it's the hard stuff. It's the ugly stuff that other tools won't do. It's, it's rusty bolts. It's rounded off screw heads. It's broken nails. It's that kind of thing. They'll often get you out of a bind, and they can even sometimes be misused. <laughs> Thank you. That was exactly the reaction I was looking for. <laughs> I just want to be clear, I do not condone vice grip based dentistry. <laughs> That's uh, taking it too far, I think. Vice grips were invented by a serial entrepreneur named William Peterson, who after a couple failures, landed as a blacksmith uh, working as a blacksmith in a little town called DeWitt, Nebraska, just about 50 miles from where we're sitting today. Sitting today. Vice grips really hit it big in World War II when they were used in ship and airplane manufacturing, and they almost literally couldn't make them fast enough. But I think the interesting thing is that they didn't pop out of William Peterson's head as a fully formed invention. He was a physical thinker. He was a maker. He was a tinkerer. His first, uh, his process was interesting. He would first made things out of cardboard models, and then he'd try them, he'd learn from that, he'd make something else, he'd try it, and he'd learn from that. His first patent is in 1921, shown here, for this tool. This kind of looks like vice grips, but these aren't vice grips. This is more like an adjustable wrench, what we call a crescent wrench today. You can open and close the mouth with this screw, but it doesn't have that thing that we love about vice grips. That patent came almost two years later, in 1923, when he added the lever, the locking mechanism. And this is why we love vice grips. This is the secret sauce of vice grips, this four bar linkage that's adjustable. And when you get those three points, A, B, and C, when A, B, and C go into a straight line, you get a huge amplification of force. So that any little squeezing force produces a huge clamping force to the jaws. It's shown here with these two members. Any little blue force in the middle would produce a huge red force on the sides. It's the same reason why you can never get your clothesline perfectly straight. No matter how hard you pull on your clothesline, there'll always be some sag, because that little disturbance in the middle, just the weight of the clothesline itself, will react to those large forces. This is a good trick to know. If you're ever trapped in a dungeon with the Count of Monte Cristo and you need to get out, you can find two sticks and bend the bars open like this. Okay? Now, I was talking about my love of vice grips the other day. Uh, is that strange to say? Is that strange for a grown man to say that he loved vice grips? Is it strange to have an emoji with a big heart and vice grips in them? I don't care. I was talking about my love of vice grips the other day, and a gentleman came up to me and explained that his 88-year-old mother uses vice grips all the time. Now, this really confused me, because I didn't expect her to you know, be pulling the carburetor off of a 68 Mustang. But what he explained is that she had one of these little pairs of vice grips and her fingers don't work as well as they used to. So she uses these vice grips to clamp on that little tab on the milk jug cap, and then she can peel the ring off the milk jug. And this is the only way she can get her milk open. So that really made me smile, because I don't picture William Peterson in his blacksmith shop thinking that 93 years from now, my invention will help this woman open her milk. But that's exactly what's happening. I think that's a wonderful story. But why is it worth discussing? The first point I'd want to make is that making, like William Peterson, is a great way to help people. A lot of people talk about change, but making literally changes things. The world is a little bit different after you make something than before. It makes things real. And it's a bottom-up way of doing things. It's a bottom-up way of making a difference. Now, making can come in a lot of forms. It can be writing a sonnet. It can be building a bookshelf. It can be starting a nonprofit. It can be big things. It can be little things. But what I'm convinced of is that we would all be better off if more people made more things. Specifically, I would like it if more young people went into the making fields. Now, this is why I do what I do. I'm an engineer, and my partner is a surgeon, and we work together to make robots for surgery. We're taking a different approach than most people. Most people who make robots for surgery make big robots on the outside. 
We make little robots that are literally inserted into the body. So little robots on the inside instead of big robots on the outside. Our first application that we're working on is colon resection. Your colon goes up, across, and down, and out the bottom. And unfortunately, people often get cancer in their colon, and they need a section of their colon removed. And again, unfortunately, that's often done with a 6-inch or an 8-inch or a 10-inch midline incision so that the surgeon can remove the cancer. This is a big deal. It's a tough procedure, usually resulting in about an average of 10 days of stay in the hospital. We think with our robots, we can put them in a smaller incision in the belly button and remove the cancer and get you out of the hospital in three or four days rather than 10. Now, a lot, of, a lot has to come together to make this happen. There's electronics, there's computers, there's software. There's the clinical side, there's the business side. No one has the skills to do this all themselves. Making this product brings us together to make things. Now, tying back to William Peterson, what I think is interesting is this robot didn't come out of our heads as a fully formed invention either. It's been a long process over many years of 40 or 50 different prototypes. You can see some of them here. We made a robot, we tried it out, we learned from that, and we made another robot, we tried it out, and we learned from that. And we did that 40 or 50 times. The robots we made in the beginning looked nothing like the robots we have now. Now, an interesting example of this is Henry Ford. In 1900, no one knew how to make an automobile because no one had ever done it before. So Henry Ford made an automobile, he drove it around the streets of Detroit, and he learned from that. He liked some things, he didn't like some things, and he went back and he made another automobile. And then he made a Model C, and a Model D, and a Model E, until he got to the Model T. Now T is the 20th letter in the alphabet. Henry Ford thought through the problem of how to make an automobile by making 20 different models. When he hit Model T, he sold 15 million of them, he created a lot of jobs, and he literally changed American society. We took our family to see the 15 millionth Model T just a few months ago. The same is true for the Wright brothers, who before they made an airplane made several gliders. I have gliders in my presentation today. Yes, by the way, those are the same steps. In 1900, 1901, 1902, they made gliders. In 1903, they made a powered airplane that flew a little bit, but it took them 1904 and 1905 to really make a practical airplane that could turn and stay in the air and do th things like that. They thought through the problem physically too. The same is true for their sister Catherine, who was so important to their work and so important to their lives, but isn't mentioned enough, I don't think, when the story of how the airplane is invented is told. Now, these are all examples of tinkering and making as a way of thinking. The trouble is, tinkering and making don't get the respect that they deserve. I'm describing an important intellectual process. Making and trying and learning and making and trying and learning is just as valid as the scientific method. I think it's particularly important for innovation. I think it may be more important to our society than things like academic publications and double-blinded studies. Now, you've all heard the expression that you should measure twice and cut once. I think this is a terrible way to proceed. <laughs> the assumption there is that you know how long the board should be. The assumption there is that you know what the airplane should look like. The assumption there is that you know what the car should look like. But that's rarely true when you dig into a difficult problem. I think the better advice is you should not measure, and you should cut twice. <laughs> or you should cut 20 times, because that 20th board might be your Model T. The problem is that we teach people to think, think, plan, think, and then make. But what we need to realize is that making can be a better way of thinking. I'll say that again because I think it's important. We teach people to think and then make, but what we need to realize is that making is an important way of thinking. I've seen this in my own work. I've seen this in others. When they make something, they build something, they try it out and it breaks, and their eyes light up. Because only in that moment do they realize how they should have made it. And you have to make it and try it to get to that moment. So the last point I'd like to make is that we are all makers. Sometimes people come up to me and say, you know, Shane, I'm just not the creative type. I'm not good with my hands. But first of all, be very wary of denying this in yourself. I think we are all makers. And don't pigeonhole making. Making can come in a lot of forms. Everything from making cakes to building companies Making can come in a lot of forms and means a lot of things. I think it's part of the human condition. 
I think it's like humor and sports and music. We all engage in these things to one extent or another. We are all makers. So, given that, I want to issue all of you makers a challenge. Everyone in this audience and everyone who hears this speech, I want you to make something. I want you to make something in the next couple weeks, and I want you to tweet a picture of it with the hashtag MakeNE, MakeNebraska, MakeNE. And I want to see hundreds and hundreds of pictures of things in the way we have changed the world, things that exist then but don't exist now. Let's all make something. Let's make a bottom-up revolution. Maybe one of you can make that tool that's not designed for any specific job but is the only tool that can get the job done. Wouldn't it be wonderful if one of our hashtag pictures somehow, somewhere, would help someone open their milk jug 93 years from now? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>